Well, good morning and welcome to worship today. Haven't you been blessed with the Spirit of the Lord in our midst? Over the last several weeks, we've been taking a road trip. We've been journeying through First and Second Peter, and today we come to the end of this leg of our road trip. We've been looking at how Peter has been speaking to a church that's been scattered all across the Middle East, throughout Turkey and, and Minor, Asia Minor at that time. And we come to the end of this series. Next week, we're going to begin a new series called Thank God It's Monday. Now, how long has it been since you said that? Probably a long time. You're kind of used to the TGIF, aren't you? It's not thank goodness it's Friday, it's thank God it's Friday, but, but, but really God wants to connect not only with you from Sunday to Wednesday to Sunday or from Sunday to Sunday, God wants you to connect your work and Him and everything that you do throughout the week in every aspect of your life and all that you do, all of your activity as well as your work. God wants to be present. And so we're going to talk next week throughout the month of September of how to bring that connection together and say, thank God it's Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday because I get to live out my faith. I get to share Christ with where I am and whom I'm with. You know, there's a lot of work going on around us and a lot of work in our church. I figured out this week that if you add up everything that goes on in our church between Monday and Saturday, we have over 1,200 different people come through our doors. I'm not talking Sunday. I'm not even adding in Wednesday night. But when you just go from Monday to Sunday, because you think 175 kids in our preschool, and you double that with parents, you say, well, not every child has, a, has two parents, but they have siblings, and so they come. And So you're talking over 550 to 600 people that just come through our preschool. You add in our private school, Providence Classical Christian Academy, and you're talking another 500 people. You add in our martial arts, Living Waters, you add in our MOPS group, and that meets every other week, so you divide them in half. Or you add in the PTO meetings and PTA meetings and, and all the different groups that happen in our facility. And that's not including our women's Bible study and our Wednesday night electives. That's not including you here this morning in our service this evening. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? There's a lot of work going on. There's a lot of activity going on in our church. And you think about today, we're signing up for life groups, and it's not only what happens in the building, it's what happens outside of the building. And life groups meet all throughout the week. Some of them meet on Sunday nights, some on Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Living uh, Waters Martial Arts meets on Tuesdays and Thursdays each week. And I encourage you, find some type of group to be a part of, a, a life group to do life together. And if you don't find a group out there that you can connect with, there's a couple of pages that say new group. Just sign up for a new one and start a group by having people to your home or over to somebody else's house or meet at a restaurant and, and discover, discover what God is wanting to do through you as a group. Think about that in life groups. I think about caravan kickoff going on Wednesday night. Pastor Rob's already talked about the electives coming up this week. And, and then you think about the work going on around the church. Have you noticed any dirt piles, any, any streets that really shouldn't be there, but all of a sudden they've appeared? You've noticed some detour signs, and, and you know, and maybe you don't know, but starting this week on September the 1st, Bellevue Road to the east of us is going to be closed from September 1st to December 31st, and they are making that little two-lane road into a five-lane boulevard. And it's going to go from all the way to the Target, all the way north of Bellevue Elementary School. And so there's going to be a lot of changes. You're going to have to find a different way to church, a way to get around the community during this time. During the same time, they're finishing up work on Pinnacle Hills Parkway right here to the west of us. From the neighborhood market down here to this corner. And actually, it's not going to stop at this corner, but it's going to go all the way across this field, across the street from us, and tie in to Champions, which will ultimately tie in to Mount Hebron and go all the way to 264. And Pleasant Grove, after they get that finished, then they're going to tear Pleasant Grove up in front of our church. And that's all going to be a mess. And they're going to hook in Pleasant Grove from Bellevue School all the way across over to Southgate. And it's going to tie together right over here at this intersection. We're going to have four streets converging right here at this intersection on the south 
west corner of our property. There's a whole lot of work going on. And in that process, we're going to be doing some things as a church because the city has agreed to put in some new entrances on the side of our property. And so you won't be able to get to us only by Pleasant Grove, but there'll be a new entrance over on Pinnacle Hills Parkway right here where that parking lot stubs out, but it goes into a field. That will be a street. And then there'll be another entrance to the north of our property, about 250 feet, that the city's putting in and then tying that back into the road behind our property. And what we're praying about is how we can take advantage of this time when a lot of things are being all shooken up and we can go ahead and put in an additional parking lot over here to the north of our property. And so we're praying about how we can do that. So there's a lot of work going on. And First Peter comes along and says, on the midst of your journey, in the midst of your traveling through life, there's a lot of work going on inside. There's a lot of work going on outside. And so what is the roadmap that you need to follow to be who God's called you to be, to live in this world that God's called you to live. And so we've been on this journey. And if you have your Bible, I invite you to turn over to 1 Peter chapter 5, and we're going to continue on this journey and look at what Peter is saying to these believers that are scattered, these first century Christians that, that he's writing to, and he's writing some very key statements as he comes to the final part of his letter. Now, I know a lot of you don't write letters anymore. Um, I, I still get letters. And the letter I usually get is from my mom. And she writes these letters, and she writes long letters, and she may just talk to me on the phone the day before, but then I'll get a letter in the mail because that's how she grew up. And, and I love it, but I've always noticed something about her letters. She starts with big letters, big writing at the front, and then when she gets down to the end, it gets real small, and then she begins to write over on the side of the margin, and then she kind of writes upside down because she has these final things that she needs to say. Here's Peter who said all these amazing things on this road trip. And, and now he gets down to the end, and he starts writing a little bit smaller. And he turns a little bit, and he writes in the margin, because I've got some things I've just got to share with you. You've got to know this before we wrap up this leg of our journey. And so pay attention. And so what Peter does is he gives us some principles along this journey through life, this, this road map, these important principles for Christian living. And the fact is, though they were written some 2,000 years ago, they are apropos for today. They have a lot to say to you and to me about how to live this life God has called us to live. So won't you look there at 1 Peter chapter 5, and we're going to see six principles. First principle that Peter wants us to see right here as he wraps up this book is he says this, this phrase, get the right kind of leader. Look at 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 4. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade. Peter's writing these words, and he, and he uses these, this statement. He addresses it to elders. These are top spiritual people in the church. These are, these are the, the leaders, the men at this time who were guiding the church and, and leading the church. They were wise and mature. They were faithful. The word, their work is summarized really in this one phrase. They are to shepherd the flock of God. What shepherds are to sheep, so elders are to the church. To the congregation, they oversee, they lead, they, they correct, they protect the flock that God has. If it's teaching, then let them teach. If it's, if it's correction, let them correct. If it's guidance, then, then, then guide. If it's comfort, then comfort. The elders represent the chief shepherd, Peter says, the Lord Jesus Christ, to the congregation. What's interesting about these words is, are, are these words represent not just spiritual leadership and in who these people are, it represents in what they are. Elders must serve willingly, eagerly, 
not for gain, but as good examples to the flock. You see, God blesses men and women who serve in this way. And, and there's a reward, Peter says, in heaven. The fact is, leaders are key in any organization, and especially in the church. Leaders stand out. They're enthusiastic. They lead us. They encourage us. They, they challenge us. They correct us. And, and that excitement spills over to us. And you go, well, why is, is Peter bringing this, this issue out that we need, to, we need to get the right kind of leaders? He does so because everything rises and falls on who is leading. Find the right kind of leaders, he says, because if you find a strong church, they're strong because they have the right leaders. Now, most of you, most of us, we don't, we don't shepherd uh, a flock, so to speak. You don't pastor a church full time. You don't, you don't do this as a vocation. And, and, and I do, and Pastor Rob, and Pastor, uh, Pastor Glenn, all of us, Pastor Kathy, we do that. That's what God's called us to do, and you enable that to happen. But though you don't shepherd a flock, so to speak, full time, you still have spiritual influence. You still have a place of spiritual leadership. That God's flock for you is the people that he's placed in your world, the people that you work with, the people that you live with, the people that you encounter are the flock, the people that God has put around you, and he has commissioned you to love those people into relationship with him. That, that, that through your life, through your attitude, through your actions, through your example, Peter says, they would come to faith and know the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says an amazing thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, follow me as I follow the example of Christ. The truth is leaders, our whole, our whole basis for leadership is following the master, following the head shepherd, the Lord of Jesus Christ. And we do that by modeling, not just by talking about it, but by living it. And the truth is every one of us believers influence other people. And we need to be the kind of leaders that people can follow. Peter now moves from the shepherd to the sheep. And the second principle he gives us is not just choosing the right kind of leaders, but he calls us now to follow our leader. To, 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 in this principles of life and in this road that we're going down, following this road map that he has for us, he says, follow the people God has put in place for you. Look at verse 5. Fascinating, he says this, young men. In the same way, be submissive to those who are older. I kind of wonder if Peter addresses young men because when we're young, guys, we, we typically tend to be, oh, you might say nicely headstrong. You might say gently impulsive. And, and so Peter is, is writing and he says, in stressful times, if there's going to be unity... When times are challenging, when times are difficult, if there's going to be unity, it's going to be because we're following the leaders that God has put before us, or we begin to fracture and begin to split. We see examples of that over and over again in past history, even recent history. And the scripture says, if you want to scatter the sheep, you strike the leader. And so we lift up our leaders, we pray for our leaders, we don't idolize them, we don't worship them. We hold them as support, we hold them accountable, but we get behind them and follow them. I heard my dad as he's going through uh, chemo and radiation right now, he, he says something fascinating to me. He says, you know, I went to the doctor the other day and the doctor said, now are you doing everything I'm telling you to do? He goes, yeah, I am. Are you taking the medicine the way I'm telling you to take it? Well, yes. Well, are you doing the exercise and the treatments the way I'm telling you to take them? Well, yes. And all of a sudden, my dad realized what he was doing. He says, now, Doc, just a moment. I just need to tell you this. I do everything that you tell me to do. And if I don't do everything you tell me to do, it's because I don't trust you. And if I don't trust you, I'm going to find a different doctor. <laughs> Why would I come to you and expect you to help me and guide me and, and give me instructions and then me not do what you tell me to do? And yet, how many times do we do that? Follow the leaders. You see, God has established a chain of 
of care. Now, we kind of say a chain of command, and I realize that, but there's a, it's more of a chain of care in our homes and in our church and our workplaces in our government, in our society. And, and part of that chain rests on the truth of the wisdom that comes from, not just from the younger, but from the older. Now, I know as soon as I say those words, I think of hundreds of examples of people who are young that have amazing wisdom. I mean, they've got amazing ability, and they can, they can do things and guide things and lead things. And at the same time, I can think of a lot of older people who are just as foolish as the day is long. I mean, they've just made bad decisions, and they continue to make bad decisions. But the principle still is in place. Wisdom comes through experience. And that we who are younger, I should say those who are younger than me, who are young people, need to listen to that wisdom. Maybe it's a point of just saying, you know, you've been there, you've, you've done some things, maybe you haven't done it all right, but do you have some insight for me? Do you have some wisdom for me? What was your advice in this situation? Well, I may not follow it completely, but, but I want to have that insight, that wisdom that you have. I want you to mentor me. I want you to guide me. And the application is pretty simple. If somebody's older, listen carefully to what they have to say. Pay attention to them. That great confidence is the mark of youth, but tested wisdom is the mark of maturity. Listen to these verses. I put them on your outline. The glory of young men is their strength. Gray hair is the splendor of the old. Or gray hair is the crown of splendor. It is attained by a righteous life. Or the third one, rise in the presence of the aged. Show respect for the elderly and revere your God. I am the Lord. And we all said amen. That there's something about listening and respecting and, and, and not just pushing aside somebody who's been down the road before us because why repeat the same mistakes? Think about that last verse. Why, why would God be so concerned about respecting others, respecting those in leadership, or respecting those who are older than us. I think the key is this, is that when we respect those in leadership and those who are older than us, we're actually showing our respect for God. Because it's, it's, it's all about learning how to yield our own will and submit our will to what God has to say. That's why the leader's of a church, of a, of a Christian group, ought to be godly people, godly men and women, whose faith has been tested, who's developed some wisdom. Oh, they might be young in years, but they are rich in experience. Oh, they might be old in years, and they may have very little experience, and yet we learn and we listen. And the older must be willing to teach the younger, and the younger must be willing to listen to the older, Peter is saying. That for a church to prosper, we need the right kind of leader and we need the right kind of follower. Very practical, isn't it? A third principle Peter lays out for us is this. Practice humility. Look at verses 5 and 6. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand and he, that he may lift you up in due time. So Peter's been talking about the outer life of the church. Now he talks about the inner life. The life of what God is doing on the inside. The relationships we have one another. And he says something very strange. He literally says, clothe yourself with humility. Literally practice humility. The word for, for clothe is the, is the Greek word, the, the word meaning literally to put on the apron. To clothe yourself. It's kind of like Jesus on that last supper night where he took his outer garments off and he put a towel around himself and he washed the disciples' feet. That there's something about bowing down and humbling ourselves that enables God to do amazing things. Humility is kind of tricky, isn't it? I mean, because it's, as soon as you think you have it, you probably don't. D.L. Moody, a famous evangelist at the turn of the 19th century, 18th century, to 19th century, he used to pray this prayer. He says, Lord, make me humble, but no, don't let me know you're doing it. 
I had a pastor I worked with in California when I served out there, a retired pastor, and he was such a, a saint, George Carrier. And he always would tell me the story, and I don't know if he was trying to, to say something to me that I wasn't just understanding as a young man, but he said, you know, there was a pastor one time, and he was so humble that the church leaders gave him a tie in recognition of his humility. He wore it the next Sunday to show it off, and they took it away from him for his pride. <laughs> humility is something that's hard to define, but when you, you see it, you recognize it, and when you don't see it, you know it's absent. Humility comes from a, a proper understanding of God's grace. That when we are humble, what, the reason we're humble is we recognize that life is a gift that God has given us. It's His grace that, that gives us all that we have. Oh, we didn't just work for it with our own hands. Oh, we didn't just think it up ourselves. God blessed us and enabled us. And I think one of the hardest things in life is to recognize that everything you have and I have is on loan from God. Someday we're going to give it back. Someday we're going to turn it back in. We're going to, we're going to take it and, and we're going to give an account. And God's going to ask us, what did you do with what I gave you? Because you can't hang on to it. You have to lay it down to move forward. And we'll be brought into question about how we recognize that life is a gift and we live by God's grace and not by our own bootstraps. But we humble ourselves and we practice it. Watchman Nee is a, uh, he's long since gone, but he was a Chinese evangelist. He used to tell the story of a man that he knew that lived near him and he was a, he was a poor rice farmer. He lived up in the mountains and every morning he would get up into the mountains and he would begin to pump water into his rice paddies. He would have to pump the water way up the hill to get it to the, the furrows where he had his crops planted. And every morning he would do that and he would pump and pump and pump. And then when he would go up to check on his crops, he had realized that his neighbor had opened up the dike and all of the water had flown out of his field into his neighbor's field below his. Well, he was a Christian. He ached over it, and he cried out to God over it. And finally, one day, he had had enough, and so he called together a Christian friend, a brother that he admired and who gave him wisdom, and he began to pray with this brother to see what God would have him do about this other person that was literally stealing his work. After prayer, he had clarity, and he knew what he had to do. So he got up the next morning, and instead of watering his field first, he watered his neighbor's field. Then he closed the dike and watered his field. Watchman Nee said what happened is over just a short period of time, his neighbor came to faith in Christ because he saw Christianity in action. He saw a guy humble himself. He says, submit yourself to the Lord, to the almighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. The truth is, it's not time yet, but there will come a time. Another principle Peter lays out for us in this journey through life is release anxiety. That's a big one, isn't it? Look at verse 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. You ought to memorize that verse. Say that with me, would you? Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. J.B. Phillips paraphrases it this way. He says, you can throw the whole weight of your anxiety on him for you are his personal concern. Another translation says, unload all your worries on him. The New Living Translation says, Give all your worries and cares to God, for He cares about what happens to you. The message, a very popular paraphrase, says it this way. Live carefree before God. He is most careful with you. Live carefree before God because He's most careful with you. The whole word... The image of cast, cast your cares or, or, or throw your cares upon God is to, is to say release them with vigor. It, it, it's kind of like when you're out hiking and backpacking. I love to do that. And, and at the end of the trip, you take your backpack off and you just toss it on the ground. You've let your burden down. You've cast it off. You unload your worries on God. 
But another word he uses, not just cast, but he says, cast all your anxiety. And the word anxiety literally means to divide, to, to separate. Anxiety produces a divided mind, and it, and it pulls this way and it pulls that way. I have to confess that much of this week I have had a divided mind. I, I've, I've put off doing a lot of work that I need to be doing on my doctoral program. And so I pulled out all my books and my papers and my syllabus again and prepared for my October class where I'm going to China and Korea and meeting with believers there and, and, and talking about God's work and, and leadership transformation. And I realized that I'd miscounted the number of books that I needed to read and number of papers that I need to write. Instead of 14 books, it's 22 books. Instead of four papers, it's eight papers. Besides my dissertation. Don't you feel my anxiety? <laughs> oh. And that's in the midst of doing everything else. And so I was just, Paul had to tell you, I was just kind of like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? I can't if you count the days down. I'm going to have to read a book a day and write a paper a day. And what am I going to do? And, and all of a sudden I was looking at this passage again in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Cast all your anxiety upon the Lord. Because he cares for you. And all of a sudden, a peace began to come over me. And, and all of a sudden, I began to get a different perspective. And, and I felt like the Lord said, Alan, it's okay. Let's do some planning. Let's do some preparation. That means you've got to set aside some time from 6 a.m. to 12 p.m. You've got to block it out and say goodbye. And nobody's talking to me. You've got to study. I can do that. Sort of. With some discipline. But it's the issue of casting, unloading that care upon the Lord. And he says, he says this, is that either we cast our cares upon him or we carry them. It's, it's not an either or. It's, I mean, it's not, it's not both and. It's either or. We do it or God does it. If we do it, we're distracted, we're discouraged, we're frustrated, we're confused, we're burdened. But when we cast it upon him, oh, yeah, we may still have difficulty. We may still have trouble. But God gives us the peace through the way of the wilderness. The reason we can have confidence that, that Peter says is four simple words. He cares for you. He cares for you, casting all your anxiety, offload all of your dropped balls and all of your, give away all of your bad choices and, and cast and fling all of your sin on him because he cares for you. He cares what goes on in you, what happens to you, what's the result of what you do. He cares. So be carefree before God because he's careful with you. The secret kind of touches on a fear that I think really plagues a lot of us. And the fear is this, is that if we submit ourselves to God, if I really cast my care upon Christ, if I really submit my life to Jesus, he's going to mess everything up. I mean, if I, if I really say, God, I'm giving you my all, he's going to ask me to do something I don't want to do. He's going to put people in my life that I don't want in my life. I mean, he's going to call me to places I don't want to go. And so there's a fear that if I cast myself upon the Lord, I'm really not sure that he cares for me. I'm not sure that he's really going to come through for me. I, I think he's just kind of setting me up for a big fall. And it's going to be miserable because I'm going to have to do things and be with people I don't even want to be with. I'm convinced that most of our problems are really theological problems. I think most of our problems in life, when we struggle and, and we're down and we're discouraged, when, when things aren't going right and we just kind of throw our hands up in frustration, come back not to the event, not to the happenstance, not even to what people are doing to us. To us. It comes back to a theological issue. Do we believe God cares for us? Do we really believe it? Because if we've cast ourselves on him, the scripture says he does. You can trust in him. He has, has your best interests 
in mind. And then on the other side, there's some of us that we don't have any problem casting our cares upon God. Our problem is that we just keep reeling them back. You know, our problem, we throw them out there and we say, God, here you are. And then we're just kind of reeling, oh, it's right there in front of me again. It's kind of like fishing. It's just a catch and release. You know, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just catching, I'm pulling it back in. And, and that old song we used to sing, bring your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Cut that string. Give it to the Lord because God cares for me. I mean, he shows that in giving of his own son to die for my sins when he didn't need to do that. He, he could have just wiped me off the face of the earth and you too. But he cares for us like a compassionate father. And on the basis of that, we can unload all of our worry on him. Fifth principle Peter gives us is this. Watch out for the enemy. Oh yeah, cast your cares upon the Lord, but don't you get lazy. Look at verse 8 and 9. Be self-controlled and be alert. Your enemy prowls like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. It's a counterbalance, isn't it? It's not just, well, God, I'm going to give it to you, and woohoo, I'm going to have some fun now. I've got it all. You've got it covered. I'm out of here. He said, no, you be careful, because you have an enemy that knows you as well as you know yourself. He knows your weak parts. He knows your strong parts. Matter of fact, he doesn't just attack you where you're weak, though he is good at doing that, because Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, to literally suck the life out of us. To make us frail, empty, transparent vapors, phantoms in this life. You know people like that. You felt like that before. Where Jesus says, I've come that you may have life and have it abundantly. But he doesn't only attack us at our weak points. It's those, those places of besetting sin. Those places of temptation. Those, 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 those habits. Those addictions. He also attacks us at our strengths. That a strength out of balance becomes a weakness. Oh, I'm, 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 a, I'm able to think things through and I can do this on my own and all of a sudden I don't need God anymore. He defeats me. Oh, I'm so smart, I can figure this thing out and I don't need God and he defeats me. Oh, I'll never fall there. Kind of like Samson and Delilah. And yet, what happened to Samson? You see, we have a a, a, an enemy that roars around, he prowls around like a lion. And what does prowl mean? It's, it means he's looking, he, he's searching, he's, he's trying to find those chinks in the armor, those weak times, those times that you're just, you're discouraged or you're down or maybe you're too proud. And he gets you right at that spot. It's fascinating in sports. And when I was in high school, we played football, and I, it was a tackle, believe it or not, in football. And, and we would watch films, the old 16 millimeters of other teams, and we would watch them, and our coach would stop the film, and he'd say, did you see that? And all of us would go, no, we didn't see anything. He said, let me replay it for you. And he, he said, look right here. They keep running the same play, but they keep leaving the same lane open. So when we play them next Friday night, that's where you go. You see, Satan watches your game films. He knows your habits. He knows your weakness. He knows your frailties. He knows your strength, where you're going to put the armor up and you say, I've got this covered. And then he gets you from behind. So what does Peter say? Stay alert. Be, be aware. Pay attention. And he gives a twofold strategy. First strategy is this, Resist. He says, resist the devil, resist him by standing firm in the faith. Now, now look at the article. He says, the faith. We don't defeat Satan by standing firm in our faith or our parents' faith or our pastor's faith. We don't defeat Satan by standing firm in a faith. We defeat Satan by standing firm in the faith. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God, the foundational truth of Scripture that gives us everything we need to withstand the attacks of the enemy. You think about what Jesus did in his temptation experience. 
You read it in Matthew 4 and the other Gospels. You, you read about how Jesus went to the wilderness for 40 days. And at the end of that time, Satan comes to him to tempt him. You know he was tired. You know he was hungry. You know that he was exhausted. You know that, that God had, and the Father and him had been talking and he knew what was coming up. He knew the cross was ahead of him. And Satan comes to him in the weakest point of his life and he says, now if you'll just bow down to me, if you'll just worship me, if you'll just do what I want you to do and, and you give me the glory, then I'm gonna give you all this stuff. And how did Satan respond? I mean, how did Jesus respond? He didn't say, Satan, I just need to tell you, I'm the big man's big boy. I mean, I, I'm, I'm the son. You know what I mean? Back off, Satan. I'm going to have daddy come and get... He, he, didn't, he, didn't say, he didn't say, well, look at me, Satan. I'm, I'm the Messiah. And I'm going to be saved. Look at me, Satan. I'm, I'm, I'm one with the Father. He didn't say any of that. You know what he said? He says, it is written. It is written. And then he began to quote different scriptures that attacked each of the, the targets, each of the, 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 the fiery darts that Satan began to throw at him, and it combated each one of them. It wasn't that he rested in himself, he rested in the eternal word of God. And here's Jesus who does that, well, what about us? When the enemy comes at us and says, you no good, no good, you just lousy person, you sin. how could God love you? And you say, I'm beloved of the Lord. For God so loved the whole world, he loved me, that he said, if I would believe. And, and all of these things that, that I can do all things through Christ, he gives me strength. If I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me of my sins. That if I trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not on my understanding, that he will guide my paths and make them straight. That, that all of these things that all of a sudden I have, the word, that's the weapon. That's my shield. He says, resist the devil by standing firm in the faith. And then he says a second thing, which is fascinating. He says, and remember. Remember your brothers and sisters who are at this very moment standing firm around you. You see, you're not the only one. Quit whining. You know, don't, don't, don't just say it's all about me because there are other people that got it worse than you. There are people that are struggling with all kinds of terrible diseases. There's people that are being attacked. Their integrity is being challenged. There's people that their spouses have deserted them. There's people that their kids have turned away from. There's people that the government is pounding on their door. There's people that have been put in prison, not because of their own failings and their own shortcomings and their own sin, but because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Remember, you're not alone. Remember that if they can stand firm, you can stand firm. Remember that you've got a cloud of witnesses surrounding you, encouraging you to finish the race. I thought so many times when life has gotten tough and, and just things have happened and garbage has happened, I thought how easy it is to quit and walk away. And then I look at the goal. I, I look beyond where I am to say, God, what do you want me to see outside of this situation? And I begin to see that I'm not the only one having difficulty or thinking I'm having difficulty. And then I begin to see that there's even something beyond that. Be self-controlled and alert, Peter says. Submit yourselves to the Lord. Resist the devil, James says, and he will flee from you. And he goes on and he says this amazing thing, because you know that they are suffering these same kinds of trials that you don't have to be suffering alone, that God is going to see you through. And then he gives this last principle. Trust in the Lord for your stability. When it seems like everything else is falling apart, it seems like you're having a hard time making it, it just, it's just tough. Peter gives this, this last principle in a form of a benediction. And you know what a benediction is. A benediction is what we say at the end of the service. It's a blessing. It's a way of kind of wrapping it all up. It's a way of putting it in perspective and, and realizing it's really all about God and not about us. Verse 11 or verse 10. He says, And the God of grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. 
Peter's going, well, how do you deal with difficulties? How do you deal with instability? How do you deal with the uncertainties of the time? Peter's going, look beyond the present. Look to the future. That after you've suffered a little while, you think about our lives um, are really just a vapor, the Scripture says. Oh, it's given unto man to, to live a certain number of years, and then comes judgment. Uh, 70 years, 80 years, 90 years, some people shorter than that. But in view of eternity, it's just a blip. It's just a dot. It's just a dash. We get that privilege of being here, doing life and living that life. And when the difficulties come, we recognize that this is not all there is to it. David says in Psalms, he says, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. There's hope. There's possibility. And, and, and ultimate fulfillment is the promise that God gives us that we will be with him. And it's not just in heaven, but it's even now. And he uses four words. He says, God will restore you. God will give you grace and, and help you. He will, he will make up for what you lack. He says, God will make you strong. That God himself will give you what you need to complete the task. He says God will make you firm, stable. That he'll give you the strength even when you're weak. And God will make you steadfast. The Living Bible paraphrases it this way. He says he will personally come and pick you up and set you firmly in place and make you stronger than ever. Why would God do that? Why, why is God doing all of this? The scripture says because of this reason. He has grace for you. If you're confused, he's got grace for you. If you're discouraged, he's got grace for you. If you're upset, he's got grace for you. If, if you're angry, he's got grace for you. If you're guilty, he's got grace for you. If you feel like giving up, He's got grace for you. If you feel like the whole world is turned against you, He's got grace for you. What kind of grace do you need? God has it in unlimited supply. He has grace for you. Verse 11 goes on and says, To Him be the power forever and ever. That He has all the grace I need and all the power to accomplish what needs to be done. So in light of what God has promised, don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Stand your ground. Resist the devil when he attacks. Don't give in to bitterness or fear or moral compromise. Remember that God is near and he's with you. You know, it's amazing what God does to a person who's totally committed to him, totally surrendered to him. Isn't that the call? Cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Trust in him. Give him all that you are. So he gives you all that he is. To me, one of the fascinating verses throughout the gospel is where Jesus says to his followers, and he, he tells them parables, and he teaches them, and he uses the phrase, I am. I'm the door, I'm the way, I'm the life, I'm the gate, I'm the good shepherd. Over and over, he uses this word, this phrase, I am. It's reminiscent of the name of God himself. I am that I am. And what it reminds me and what I believe the Spirit would say to us through that is he is everything you need him to be when you need him to be it. He has grace for you. Have you cast all your cares upon him? Have you cast them and then you reeled them back? Have you been secretly afraid that if you really did what God told you to do, you'd have to do something you don't want to do? Is it really because you don't believe that he cares for you? you know, I learned a long time ago is that that I can't cause a whole lot of things to happen, but I sure can trust God along the ride. I think that's what it means to, to cast your cares, to trust in Him, to enjoy the journey, to be what Eugene Peterson is, live carefree because God is careful 
Not careful as far as cautious, but careful as far as abundance. He has grace for you. Why don't you stand with me, would you? And today, as we close out this service and we close this part of the journey, this road trip, I just want to encourage you, renew your trust in God. Cast your cares upon Him. And just right now, would you just quiet yourself and bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment to commit yourself to being open to what God would say to you. You've heard His word this morning. You've heard His call to, to put the right kind of leaders over your life and then to follow them. To be humble. To cast your anxiety to the side. To be... Be alert and watch for the attacks of the enemy to resist and remember and to trust in God for your stability because His grace is sufficient. His grace is abundant. And this morning, as we close our time together, I just want to open up our altar. Maybe you need to come and pray today. And say, God, I've been reeling those cares back in. Or the truth is, I've never really cast my cares completely on you because I haven't been sure. And I'm still struggling with that right now that you really care. But by the authority of God's word, would you just put your faith in him and believe what he says is true and he will prove it to you. Father, we declare that we are helpless and hopeless without your grace. But you care for us. And you wash away our sin. You wash away our sin and give us new life through your Holy Spirit. You declare us not guilty, though we are. You take our guilt and you give us your righteousness because of your great kindness and grace. You guarantee us an inheritance of eternal life. You give us strength and wisdom and and help to resist the enemy of our soul. And remember your faithfulness and the faithfulness of the saints that have gone before us. So that we can live carefree lives. Because you care for us. Lord, whatever it takes do your work in me whatever it takes lead me in your way whatever it takes work in me and use me that I would glorify you And your word reminds me and tells me and convinces me that when I humble myself before you, you lift me up. You give me a place to stand. You lift up the shame of my face and give me the brilliance of your presence. I surrender all to you. Have you done that this morning? Have you done that in the past? Today, you need to reclaim that. You need to re-solidify that. You need to re confirm that Lord I give myself to you I cast all my cares upon you and I declare by faith that you care for me and your grace is sufficient for me that even in my weakness you are made strong thank you for your love and grace today Lord Jesus thank you for your mercy that you supply everything that we need that your grace is enough we cast our cares upon you declaring you care for us amen and as we go from this place a reminder that a great place to not only just have given your cares to god here at the altar or at your seat but to gather with a group of believers that you can share your burdens with, that will lift you up each week, each day in prayer. And so that's why we encourage Sunday school. That's why we encourage life groups because we don't do this on our own. 
we need each other. And so find a place, there's so many to fit in, to belong to, and we desperately need that relationship with each other. So go in peace today and serve the Lord. And all God's people said, amen.